So good evening, everybody. Um, and I guess still good afternoon for those tuning in on the West Coast late afternoon. Um, many of you know me, my name is Eric Story. I'm the Outreach Manager at the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies in Waterloo, Ontario. And I'd like to welcome you all to our third event in the fall lineup of our speaker series, which tonight is in partnership with the Canadian Landmine Foundation. Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Military Center resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. In 1701, this land fell under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, a treaty that was part of the Great Peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars of the 17th century. It represented and continues to represent today an eternal agreement to share and protect resources as well as solving conflicts peacefully. 80 some years later, um, the Haldeman Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown following the American Revolution. And the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from just north of Orangeville today to its source at Lake Erie. Now today, this treaty territory, it remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities, as well as the home of many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and acknowledging their presence in the past and present reminds us all of the responsibilities we hold as treaty people. Now, some of you who are, are dedicated attendees or dedicated followers might recognize that this background behind me, this immaculate bookshelf, very large bookshelf, is not the one you're used to seeing. And that's because I'm actually back here in the Laurier Military Center for the first time in a very, very long time. And again, those who have been following along, you know, the renovations are now finished, the furniture has been delivered, and we are now in the process of getting things kind of organized and back into shape so that staff, students, and faculty can return to work. Now, I did tell you last time that we were close to being able to welcome our, our patrons back, our guests back, and we are still on that boat. We are not quite ready to welcome you back, but it is coming very, very soon. And I promise when the time comes, I will share, uh, share with you all um, that, that you can return. And we really, really look forward to that time when we can finally see um, as many folks as we possibly can back here at the center. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because, of course, we have a very exciting webinar tonight. Um, tonight's webinar, it's going to be a little bit different, however. Um, tonight, we're going to be actually hosting a panel discussion um, on the Ottawa Treaty. I just want to remind everybody, as I usually do, just two kind of helpful hints to optimize your viewing experience tonight. First of all, if you're at all finding the closed captioning distracting, you can actually go to the bottom of your screen and click the CC button at the bottom and you can toggle it on and off. Secondly, what I always ask my guests um, who attend to do is if questions come to you throughout the event, because we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. If questions come to you at any time, all you have to do is go to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A button and just write your question in there and submit it to us. I don't want you to have those questions just lingering in your head because you may not be able to concentrate as well on uh, the proceedings of this evening. So do enter them into you into the Q&A as soon as they come to you so that you can enjoy um, the evening to, the, to, to your fullest extent. Why don't I turn things over to our moderator this evening, Dr. Alistair Edgar. Dr. Edgar is Associate Professor of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier University, cross appointment to the Balsillie School of International Affairs. He is an editor of the journal Global Governance and served as executive director of the Academic Council on the United Nations System from 2003 to 2000, 2008, and again from 2010 to 2018. Currently, he is the president of the Canadian Landmine Foundation. Why don't you take things away, Alistair? Thanks, Eric. Um, and thanks to everybody for, for joining us this evening. October last month was 25 years since uh, Lloyd, as uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, issued that challenge to return to Ottawa in a year and sign the convention. 
uh, and indeed uh, the convention, the treaty was opened for signature in December 97 and entered into force in 99. Um, what we'll do this evening, I'm going to introduce Lloyd now. Uh, Lloyd will speak for about 10 minutes uh, and then I'll introduce our second speaker, Olivia Fernandez. Uh, and Olivia will speak for another 10 minutes. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll open it to everybody for Q&A. So the Q&A will follow the two, uh, the two presentations. I think most people know Lloyd. Uh, if not uh, in person, they certainly know him by name. Um, I won't go through Lloyd's very extensive um, service in at the provincial and federal level, but um, in particular in our case, 1996 to 2000 as Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he was um, responsible, as you saw, for uh, pushing, promoting uh, the success of the Ottawa Treaty, uh, as well as the campaign for an international criminal court, the uh, International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, uh, initiatives against um, uh, use, uh, the use of child soldiers, and a range of other um, initiatives uh, that put Canada at the forefront of uh, humanitarian diplomacy in the world. Um, Lloyd, uh, I got to know over the last several years in particular because he continues his work with landmines as a member of the board of the Canadian Landmine Foundation. Uh, and it is in that capacity that, um, that he's going to join us today. I did want to mention one last thing, Lloyd, um, which was, and I'm going to scroll down to get this right, um, because of your work in Manitoba, and we, we do our land acknowledgements here, um, but just to let people know, um, in 2010, Lloyd was made an honorary, an honorary member of the Saking First Nation in Manitoba and was given an Ojibwe name, and I won't try to pronounce the Ojibwe name, but the translation is White Thunderbird Man. Um, so I'm happy to hand it over uh, to Lloyd, uh, White Thunderbird Man. Uh, and the um, central player for Canada behind the Ottawa Treaty. Lloyd, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Alistair. And uh, just to clarify your last point about my renaming at the ceremony, uh, the elder was very generous in providing me with the White Thunderbird Man. Uh, another one of his uh, uh, elders leaned over, a good friend of mine, and said, uh, well, Lloyd, you have to realize that uh, it also means big noise. So I think just to put that in perspective. Uh, uh, thank you for, for uh, bringing this together. Uh, I have to say, I'm still a little bit uh, sort of uh, affected by the, the documentary. I just a very short uh, 10 minutes uh, consolidated and concentrated so many of the, the happenings and emotions and things that went on in that period. And it was a very special period. Uh, in which the ability to uh, make a change, to do a difference, uh, was a, a window that, uh, compared to the world we live in now, is, uh, I guess you might call a, a, a lost age. Funny thing about the 10-minute uh, the teaser that uh, Rich put together, he makes a very important point, and that is, that this was an effort by a wide and diverse multitude of people. And clearly the role that was played by uh, the, uh, the coalition, uh, Bobby Moore's Vets for Vietnam, the, the uh, victims themselves, the uh, efforts by the uh, people on the ground who were affected to mobilize and begin putting pressures on the government. But there's also some unsung heroes. I mean, I think uh, it was good to see people like Bob Lawson and Jill Sinclair and others who were very much uh, in the in foreign affairs of the time, who were who had a commitment and a feeling and a skill that enabled us to have a confidence that when we made the call to come back in a treaty that we would actually deliver, that we weren't simply being rhetorical. We actually had the the capacity to bring it about. And that also included people, you know, other governments, you know, Austria, Netherlands, Chile, Mozambique, I mean, Cambodia. This was a kind of a cross-checking, 
involvement of uh, of governments. And by the way, none of them were the big powers. We're so so immersed these days in you know, in the, uh, the the muscle flexing of the big guys. And what we didn't realize that uh, uh, the big guys weren't involved. In, it. in fact, they were the opponents of it. But we were still able to bring about a treaty for 164 signatories. And I guess the most important thing to say is that between the, the casualties that were being faced back in the mid 90s, uh, they've been reduced by 60, 70% to where they are today. Uh, it shows uh, that there is space for political and uh, diplomatic efforts that don't have to be uh, arising out of Washington or Beijing or whatever. Uh, it's not to say they weren't there. I, I, I still have a great gratitude to uh, the, the late Robin Cook, who, when he became foreign secretary in the UK government, when the labor took over, he immediately sort of called me and said, I'm in. And that, that helped a great deal. The, the presence of uh, Cornelius Samarugo from the International Red Cross, who basically made the argument that uh, the destruction of, of people, of ordinary people, was a public health crisis in the world. And that he changed the language and also provided strong evidence for all the people in the sort of uh, echelons of defense departments who were saying it's a necessary weapon, pointing out that it was civilians who were being killed and maimed. Uh, I go back to somebody who I established a friendship with, Patrick Leahy, who, by the way, just yesterday announced that he was retiring from the U.S. Senate after close to 40 years of service. Uh, nobody could have been a stronger advocate in the United States uh, for a landmine treaty, in fact, brought legislation into the Senate. So I, I guess the point I want to make is that was there really a, a wonderful network uh, of different uh, outlooks and different beliefs and different activities who all of a sudden coalesced and united around this common object. And it also served, by the way, as a model. I mean, one of the things, one of the legacies, I think, of the landline treaty is certainly the, the impact it's had on saving lives, of opening up uh, corrupted land for new agricultural presentations. But the other model was that people began to see that there was a way of making changes internationally. Uh, it wasn't shortly after the landmine campaign was over that I had a visit from, from a group of NGOs who were promoting the idea of the International Criminal Court, holding governments accountable uh, for genocide and crimes against humanity. And we used many ways the same uh, the technique, what I used to call the Amway approach to international politics, get people out in the street, knocking on doors, flood the airways, have a partnership with, with uh, NGOs and private sector and international institutions. In other words, make it a, a, a kind of a full court press. And I think that that still is a model that's even being looked at today. I know there's the kind of realpolitik school of, of academics, and I also could tell you about uh, contending with, with that particular crowd, and they're not entirely wrong. The big guys do push things around, but it's also there is an alternative way of making change. There's an alternative way, and God knows in this age that we're in, where there's such a regression of humanitarian, human rights, human security initiatives, uh, I hope the landmine campaign would give something of an inspiration. Before leaving, uh, I want to say, however, that I just read a few days ago the latest landmine monitor report that, uh, by the way, is uh, still a, a, a grassroots uh, monitor of landmine activities around the world uh, contributed by certain governments. Uh, but the reality is, uh, they're pointing out that the landmine campaign momentum is stalling. Uh, there was a real hope when we first got into this that, <laughs> excuse me, on the 25th anniversary, we would have a landmine free world. But we're not there yet. Uh, this last in 2020, 
as the monster points out, we still had over 7,000 casualties. And some increasingly landmines are being used by non-state actors, the, the militias, the, uh, the warlords in places like Afghanistan, Myanmar, uh, even now, uh, a, re, a return in the Balkans, and certainly in all parts of places where conflict has occurred, uh, the, the casualties are still taking place. And none of us should rest uh, content until we really uh, realize the Canadian Landmine Foundation was working specifically on Cambodia, which has been one of the countries most corrupted by landmines. And uh, as Alistair was telling me in our context, they would say, the money's running out. Uh, COVID's had a real impact on the ability to continue to work on the reduction and the support for victims and enabling education to take place for, for young children because the money's being diverted. Clearly, it's an emergency. It's an existential crisis. But it means that what that crisis is, it creates sort of corollary crisis, ancillary crisis, because all of a sudden they, the money and resources and effort going in to continue to reduce uh, the landmine casualty rate is falling. Uh, and I, I, I hope that through these kind of discussions and through the documentary that Richard has done. Uh, in saying that, I, I also want to just close uh, by talking for a minute about Canada. The, the, the thing that uh, the documentary doesn't yet give full credit to uh, is uh, my boss at the time, Prime Minister Kretchen. He gave me uh, the mandate, the freedom to take this initiative on. And it came not without some pushback from some other members, colleagues in cabinet. They were saying, we were at a time with very strict financial problems. He allocated $100 million to get the Landmine King campaign started to set up the foundation, to begin working on the demining in places, to help train people. And it takes that kind of political leadership uh, to make important things happen, to make a difference. And I think that uh, as Canadians, I hope at some point we, we spend a little time reflecting and revisiting uh, how the Landmine campaign, based upon a, a broad uh, consensus we had in the government, around promoting human security, protecting of people, uh, has led to a number of other quite important international institutions. I hope we're not losing our edge as Canadians. I think that we're not donating much anymore and we're not initiating the kind of uh, broad-based, combined, coherent effort to make changes that will protect people, make their lives better. And I happen to believe deeply as a Canadian, uh, that's our vocation. That's something that we can do. Uh, we're not exceptional, but we'd have capacity, skill and values and history. And I just hope that uh, tonight and as we, we move on, that the landmine, the Ottawa Treaty will stand as a model of how this country uh, can make a difference. So Alistair, back to you. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Uh, much appreciated. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have our second speaker uh, who, and I saw in the chat function, there was a question from, from Linda from Brantford Laurier about is the landmine issue really over? Um, no, the political process um, and the challenge of landmines in the ground, uh, sadly, is not over. Um, and Olivia, I think, will have some things to tell us about that. Let me in introduce Olivia. Uh, Olivia Fernandez, uh, also on the board of the Landmine Foundation, is a humanitarian practitioner with eight years of experience managing emergency projects globally. Her work, and here is Olivia, <laughs> uh, her work spans the areas of humanitarian mine action, emergency health, post-conflict rehabilitation, and it is rooted in human rights with a particular focus on the rights of the child, the rights of indigenous people, and the rights of persons with disabilities. Olivia has worked, lived and worked in Grand Council Treaty 3, Nishinaabe Aski Nation, the Siksika Nation, Vietnam, Somalia, Nepal, India, and most recently in Afghanistan. 
Bolivia is committed to a human rights agenda and continues to work independently and collaboratively towards upholding and claiming rights on a daily basis. Uh, Olivia, I'm happy to hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Alistair. Um, I'm from Toronto, so I would like to start off by recognizing that this meeting for, for us takes place on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Treaty. To the ICPLCMC and all the affiliates and individuals, including you, Lloyd, who I don't get to say this enough to, who made this treaty thank, um, come to life, we thank you. We thank you for giving our generation a future to carry forward this work in such an unprecedented time. From the inception of the Ottawa Treaty until present day, the world has seen a drastic change in, in warfare and the use of anti-personnel landmines. According to Article 2.1 of the Ottawa Treaty, an anti-personnel mine is defined as a mine that is designed to be exploded by the presence, proximity, or contact of a person that will incapacitate, injure, or kill one or more persons. An AP mine looks to kill, maim, or injure a human being and is set off by the actions of that said human being or animal. And that could be during a war or much after the war. It's all just a gamble of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And this is one of the exact issues from which the Ottawa Treaty seeks to protect people's lives. It's from the explosive weapons that are indiscriminate and set off by people unbeknownst that their lives are about to either end or change forever. There's no escape. It's like playing Minesweeper in real life. And if you're too young for Minesweeper, then I'm sure Call of Duty has taught you a few things. And if neither of those ring a bell, let me give you a real life example of a friend of mine from Vietnam who was teaching his young daughter how to potato farm and woke up in a hospital without a leg and without his daughter because they hit a cluster bomb when they were digging. These are real people who live with the unintended unintended consequences of their pure actions. And this is the type of accident that the Ottawa Treaty looks to prevent through its implementation. So looking at the treaty today, warfare has drastically changed and improvised landmines are at the forefront of warfare, especially wars with rebel militias. And don't for one second think that rebel militias don't have the power to mass produce imp improvised devices. Paul Jefferson, one of the earliest humanitarian deminers said, a landmine is a perfect soldier, ever courageous, never sleeps and never misses. I spoke with Ed LaJoy from Halo Trust earlier this week, and I learned that four out of five IEDs found in the ground are pressure activated with technology as simple as the button that turns on your refrigerator light when you open your door. Just think for one second about how accessible that type of technology is and how easy it can be to mass produce landmines using such technology. I also learned in that, uh, that in some countries, these same pressure activated improvised mines are simple mason jars filled with syringes. While this sounds like a horror movie to us, it is the reality for so many humans living in areas that remain contaminated today. Peace agreements may be signed and hostilities may, may cease, but landmines and explosive remnants of war are a continuous legacy of conflict. I'm going to share my screen for a second to go through a quick slide presentation uh, with you before I give it back to Alistair. So this is a list of countries that you can see here in white. So the goal here is really to get the bigger, the bigger um, states to accede to the territory. Uh, um, the only signatory that has signed but not yet ratified is the Marshall Islands, which you can see here. And then the ones in green are the ones who are not signatories. And if you look really closely with the ones who are not signatories, you'll notice that those are very big countries. The United States, China, India, 
Russia, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, all countries that haven't signed. And if you look even closer, you'll see that the smaller ones haven't signed on simply out of fear that the bigger ones are still going to be using these weapons when it's actually cheaper for them to be able to make them themselves. If they sign on, then it becomes a problem if they can't use them against their opponent. So the goal here is really to get the bigger, the bigger um, states to accede to the territory, uh, um, to the treaties, so that we can get them to stop using indiscriminate weapons. There are five pillars of mine action that we're going to quickly go over um, as in what happened in 2020. So for clearance activities, which means that land is actually cleared of unexploded ordinance among state states parties, total reported clearance in 2020 was at least 146 kilometers squared. This re represents an actual decrease in the area cleared in 2019 but at least 135,583 landmines were cleared and destroyed in 2020. And we are nowhere near reaching an end target for um, clearing the ordinance that's left around the world. Between 2019 and 2020, Afghanistan cleared 24.24 kilometers square, which was down from the previous year. But you can imagine with what happened in August of 2021, that this next year's stats are going to look a lot different. For more references on these, you can look at page 59 of the Landmine Monitor, which was just released last week. For risk education, what that is, is basically teaching people in uh, civilian areas that are um, contaminated with unexploded ordnance, risk education helps keep people safe from this. So there are, global, there are global working groups in place to coordinate EOR efforts. And the International Explosive Risk, risk Education Working Group is one that pays tremendous attention to risk education year efforts year round and is really looking to innovate with technology to reach um, very rural populations where a lot of the ordinance is often found. In 2020, 26 states parties were known to have provided risk education and 163 have signed on. So we have an issue in reaching, um, in conducting risk education within the pillars of uh, mine action. And this is somewhere where we need to pay more and more attention to as we look to keep people safe. Victim assistance funding has significantly gone down over the last year due, due to, to um, diversion of funding towards COVID-19 and many, uh, mainly that, but uh, it is an area that needs utmost attention as when a mine explodes, it's not just um, a physical thing that happens. The impact is on the livelihood, the family, there's psychosocial impacts, there's impacts that go way beyond what we can traditionally think of. And victim assistance makes sure that all these areas are uh, addressed. Stockpile destruction. Um, so people are still destroying their stockpiles. There's a lot of words on this slide, I know that. But Sri Lanka has most recently destroyed their stockpiles and um, in the next three years is looking to be landmine free. And over the last year, Mozambique was declared landmine free as well. Advocacy, international funding was distributed amongst the following sectors, broken down to 68, 6, 4, 1, and 21%. Um, and advocacy funding is also pretty low. So we need to um, get in gear and really be out there supporting governments, supporting victims and supporting people who are dealing with the impacts of uh, unexploded ordinance on the ground, especially anti-personnel um, mines. And even if those are improvised anti-personnel anti -personnel mines. So Alistair, I would like to give this back to you. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to place them in the chat box. Thanks very much, Olivia. I'm just waiting, there we go. I was gonna say waiting while you unshare. Um, thanks, we, we have um, a number of, 
one the one question that we already had, which was whether the landmine issue is over, and you'll certainly have heard today um, that it isn't, unfortunately. Um, the, the Canadian Landmine Foundation, as people are um, thinking about questions, uh, the Canadian Landmine Foundation works primarily in um, the forgotten area of northern Cambodia, uh, and we support an explosive ordnance disposal team, EOD team there, um, that gets called out every single week, um, every single week, to deal with um, landmines and other and unexploded ordnance. Um, it's worth remembering, if I get my history approximately right, um, that the United States under Richard Nixon uh, dropped more tonnage of bombs on Cambodia illegally than, they, uh, than the United States dropped on Japan in all of the Second World War. Um, and when a lot of dumb weapons uh, don't go off, uh, there are all kinds of explosives, plus 20, 30 years of civil war there, all kinds of explosives from grenades, RPG rounds, um, shells, mortars, um, and other things sitting in the ground waiting for uh, Cambodians to find them, uh, usually to find them accidentally. Um, so we support uh, explosive ordnance disposal as well as mine risk awareness for young kids who don't know that this is not a toy. Uh, and also victim assistance. So a lot of different work that we do. Um, let me uh, just read out um, for you, Lloyd, uh, from Patrick Dennis. Minister Axworthy, congratulations on a quarter century of success with the Ottawa Treaty, a singular and transformative act of diplomacy that will save lives for many years to come. Uh, as Defence Counselor to Ambassador David Wright at NATO headquarters in 1997, I coined the acronyms MAT and CMAT for Canadian Mine Action Team. Mm -hmm. My focus as a military person was on the practical aspects of implementing the Ottawa Treaty. Could you share additional thoughts on the future of MAT and CMAT efforts and any concerns that you might have in this regard? That's thanks from Patrick Dennis, Colonel Retired, Kitchener, Ontario. Well, uh, first, let me say to, to Colonel Dennis that uh, I think the work that he and Ambassador Wright did was absolutely instrumental as part of that team approach that I talked about, that partnership. Uh, it, you know, I guess was, as I reflect now back on, on those years, uh, what was amazing that so many of the divisions and fragmentations we now hear about uh, weren't there. there. There was a real uh, kind of common cause uh, that, and I think that it was interesting that many of the key players in the Canadian effort for those who were in the military. Uh, my colleague, uh, Art Eggleton, was defense minister. People in the military themselves who were involved in campaigns in the Balkans and in the Middle East, they understood probably more uh, than most of us just how sort of hazardous and risky these hidden weapons really were. And that they really worked very hard to uh, establish uh, a, a good case that we could take to cabinet, we could take to the Canadian public uh, and to other countries about the importance of, of a full ban, uh, not half measures. So again, I, I want to use the opportunity to, you know, to, to recognize the role that our own military really played in helping to bring that process about. And on the question, uh, I must say, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit torn. Uh, I also just talked about the, the, the work that the foundation is doing in Northern Cambodia. Uh, I, I can cite here several areas. There are large swaths of land in Afghanistan. We're talking about the so, uh, effort to work with getting refugees out of Afghanistan. There's also a huge uh, risk factor of anybody going out to the fields. I mean, that it's going to be those who are the, the least protected who would be the most uh, most victimized by it. The same thing is happening in Myanmar. You, you have the government of, of Burma still using landmines as a way of, for military purposes. And in so many countries, uh, Mali is an example uh, where the 
uh, the, the warlord militia, uh, the extremists, are using landmines, uh, not, not factory-made landmines, but those that are, as uh, Olivia said, uh, put into a, a mason jar, uh, but they still have the same impact. They're unidentified killers. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard in a, in a political sense uh, to keep your eye on the sparrow. But I, I, I think that if we need uh, a reminder, it is that uh, we still have casualties uh, ranging over seven or 8,000 people, 60% of whom are children. Uh, and I, I think that this is, this is really, I, I would hope, uh, that through the work of the foundation and the advocacy it makes to the work that uh, Olivia and her colleagues are doing, uh, that we can reignite some interest in the Canadian government to take on, taking on this issue of arms control, disarmament, and applying the methodology that we use in the arms control. Because right now, uh, there's a passivity, there's a sort of uh, uh, ho-hum. We often get on the case of the Americans because they didn't sign the treaty. And by the way, as you know, uh, Obama had basically implemented all the requirements of the treaty in terms of stopping production. His success to Mr. Trump, of course, eliminated all that. And I would hope sometime along the way, if Mr. Biden stays in office, he'll come back to restoring the U.S. But the U.S. still is the largest donor uh, for landmine clearance, for victim assistance, and, and education. And I, I think that uh, we have to get back on, uh, back on track on these particular issues. So, uh, and that only happens if there's a public interest, if there's a public demand, if members of parliament and senators uh, start raising it in the House of Commons. Uh, someone who's served close to 30 years uh, politically, uh, you know, there's nothing like uh, uh, getting a swatch of letters or emails or phone calls saying, hey, it's time to get back in the game. And I think that uh, uh, we have such a, a unique uh, role in, to provide leadership in these areas. Canada has a great power of convening. And I think that we use that power. Uh, and that particularly now, as we're, as Olivia pointed out in her, because a lot of people who are being affected now are, are those displaced persons, refugees, who are having to cross borders. In, in Belarus, there's suggestions that refugees are those who are going to be uh, most affected by this inability to fortify our borders and to stop, uh, stop these kinds of movements. So uh, I think it really is uh, one of those moments where uh, both reflection, but uh, I think a, a strong resolution to do something about it needs to be reignited. Uh, and I'd like to see our own country take the lead. Thanks, Lloyd. I'm, I'm, um, we've got a number of questions. I'm gonna combine a couple of them or connect a couple of them uh, for uh, Olivia and then uh, come to another couple of them uh, back to Lloyd. So for you, Olivia, a question from, from Linder in, at Banford Laurier. Well, two questions. I'll ask them both and then you, you take them on. Uh, the first one from Linda. Do we need another Princess Diana to bring attention to the landmine mm -hmm. issue? Uh, and the second question, a more technical one, if you will, uh, from Jess in Toronto. How or when is a region declared landmine free? Is it possible to be certain all landmines have been removed or is this based on another metric? Okay, so I'm going to answer the second question first. Um, and Jess, thanks for asking that question. So um, yeah. a country is declared landmine free when the, the undertaking of clearance efforts involves a very thorough survey process. And when most of the civilian areas and areas that are um, people friendly have been completely cleared, then we can declare it landmine free. However, it cannot truly be declared 100% landmine free because if you look back at, um, even in the UK, World War II bombs will blow up on highways sometimes in present day. So you, 
you can't really 100% say it, but given the survey and the clearance efforts in relation to each other, that's the metric used for declaring uh, landmine free. And to answer the first question, I absolutely think we need a very compelling spokes model. <coughs> and yes, Diana was one of my favorite people ever. So um, I think it um, the movement needs to come to the same vitality that it had during uh, Lloyd and Jody's time when they created. There was so much fire in that movement. And I remember hearing it from them and seeing it and watching it and reading about it and just thinking like, oh my God, what, what a time to have been a part of this process. And now with our generation, just seeing the world really going to war in a completely different way, like what kind of spokesperson do we get? And do, to whom are we appealing? Because now we have these really big countries that aren't signing on and who can we get to appeal to them? Because bless her, Princess Diana, maybe she could have, but I don't know. I, genu I genuinely think it has to be a collective push forward from a group of people uh, in solidarity for this movement from all over the world. And I think our generation's really good at that. Thanks, and I, I'll mention, uh, I believe he still is, but um, James Bond, Daniel Craig, um, yes. was our, the UN's landmine ambassador. But if James Bond can't bring attention to it, then we need a different kind of <laughs> figure um, to get people's attention. Uh, Lloyd, I've got two um, more political questions for you. Um, the first one from Graham. Uh, did the Harper government downgrade the importance of the treaty, especially by down, downsizing the funding? That's the first question. And the second one from uh, Dr. Robert Smell, uh, who I think is in Lyle, Ontario. Um, Minister Axworthy, you mentioned some opposition to the treaty in cabinet. Can you elaborate on the concerns of those who had issues with it? So sure. first, first about well, on the first Harper. question. I, I, yeah, yeah. The, um, Stephen Harper's uh, government. Uh, you know, the, the Harper government had uh, very real interest. In fact, sometimes animosity to international agreements and treaties. They simply didn't believe that uh, the idea of uh, international multilateral cooperation was important, other than in areas of trade and economic uh, matters. Um, I, there was just a kind of animus that uh, had grown up uh, sometimes in the, in the in the right wing of the political spectrum about sort of the idea of, of uh, providing that kind of collegiality. I think it has to do with because so many people are still stuck on some of the uh, 19th century ideas of sovereignty. You know, the, you, you have to kind of uh, put them um, put the bridge back up, uh, stand on guard, when in fact we're living in a world in which there is no such thing as a sovereign state. We're also kind of uh, interlaced and interconnected. And, uh, but, but that was simply not, and there's no question that uh, uh, the decision to defund uh, landmines, uh, but I would say also, tragically, that has not been restored uh, by the, by Mr. Uh, Mr. Trudeau's government, of which you know my background, and uh, I, I support the government in many ways, but I'm, uh, I'm sad that uh, some of these issues were not corrected. Uh, and I think it has to do be, you know, just simply that uh, uh, increasingly as a country, we're losing our, our sense of uh, uh, pride in what we do internationally. Alistair, uh, when we signed the landmine treaty in 97, uh, as all governments were doing, we were doing polling and finding out what people, it was the number one most popular initiative uh, of, of the government at that day. I mean, people, I know some of the, you know, kind of the, the, the uh, Ottawa Canal crowd like to say, oh, Canadians aren't interested in international matters foreign policy, it's, ah, it, it, it's all kind of uh, inside baseball. The fact of the matter is that Canadians do take pride and support and when, when Canada shows leadership and shows interest, not just in sort of uh, 
transactional foreign policy, but value-based uh, foreign policy. And I think that that is something that, uh, I, I go back to what Olivia said, I think there is a mission for, Olivia, for your generation is to begin restoring that kind of commitment. Because I think uh, as we go through generations where it's always me too, or what's in it for me, uh, then I think uh, uh, what showed in the landmine case is that uh, uh, this collegiality of so many different groups working together, uh, I mean, where the lions were lying down with the lambs, uh, it was really a very important period. But when it happens, it can make things really take place. It is uh, a recipe. So I think we're in a little bit of a trough right now. We're coming out, I hope, coming out of a COVID issue. And now's the time to do some serious rethinking. And I think we've learned one thing from COVID is that no country is an island unto itself. And what happens in the rest of the world is going to affect us. And even the fact that I, I think one of the tragedies right now is the way in which uh, well-developed, wealthy countries have not risen to the challenge of making sure that the vaccinations are available uh, around the world on an equal basis. Just quickly unmute myself. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll owe more money to my I forgot to unmute jar. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, I've got one question um, that I'm going to, well, I'll start with, with you, Olivia, um, but um, it touches on also what Lloyd was just uh, hoping that, that Canada should do. Um, but it's a practical question and perhaps we'll, a, we'll aim it at um, the young generation first, you. Um, how might Canada actually re-engage on issues like landmines today? Uh, what, what do we need to do differently? I hate to say it, but we need to get on TikTok and we need to get on Instagram and we need to reach mm -hmm. a bunch of followers. To, these, are, these are now the new education platforms for not even my generation, Generation Z. And they're the ones who are being raised to as completely non-judgmental people. Generation Z's humanity is incredible. They really care about preserving the health of the earth and each other, which is um, uh, incredible to see how they're using social media to learn from each other. And they're actually like, I have to shout them out because they're a lot smarter than millennials and they're using different platforms. And I think what we need to do is engage those platforms to draw in the crowd. Once the crowd is drawn in, the policymakers now have the backup of all these people who are willing to go get out on the streets with you and protest and say, hey, this is not okay. We want this issue addressed now. Like we're not moving forward. We won't even go to war. This And they're strong enough to, to do that. They're a very strong will generation. And I think for us as millennials who still kind of did the traditional university um, you know, four years and then post-grad, we um, can work, we have to work together with the future generations to really make this happen in much the same way you guys said, did exactly that, the lions with the lambs. Gen Z is the lions and we're the lambs. And really that's what we, uh, what we need here is to leverage um, young people. It's the same thing that, it, it's the same call that I had as an intern at the start of my career. We want to leverage your advocacy skills. And now as a, a big time grown up, I say this to the next generation is we need to encourage your advocacy skills and we really need them. And, and we have to find even non-academic pathways to engage uh, people because it's not always going to be an academic route that's going to win. And these years are showing us that. Thanks, Olivia. And also, can I make, make yep. a comment on uh, when it, uh, what uh, intrigues me? I, I mean, I, I couldn't uh, agree more with what Olivia said. And, you know, I, I mean, uh, we're in this new world of digital communication. And I don't think that we've become, uh, as, as, uh, as government, particularly adept at understanding that it, it, it's not just a question of preventing the bad guys and the trolls from destroying it, but also using it to help mobilize around things. But, but here, and it goes back to a previous question, 
uh, about the whole question of when can you declare uh, the world to be uh, landmine free? Well, we now have technologies, uh, drones, which can basically identify you know, a, a pimple on your forehead. If we started using that surveillance, monitoring, uh, digital uh, program to begin to demonstrate how landmines are a major drawback for uh, many countries to develop because people simply are not going to leave uh, the marked path on a road uh, to go out and, and plant their turnips or their yam or whatever it may be. Secondly, uh, we're talking again about a, uh, a world where we have to restore some sustainability. We have so many areas, as Olivia's slide showed out, which are contaminated. Uh, the, the landmines, you don't get to use that land or to let it begin to flourish if you've got landmines sitting in it. It becomes a, a dangerous risk. So I, I think uh, there's a lot of new thinking, a lot of really on the edge stuff, but we now have to, in a way, kind of bring that forward and say, how would we apply uh, uh, the new form of technology uh, to both identify uh, where the mines are, uh, how you can eliminate them. When I was the, uh, uh, the chancellor for uh, was one of the important colleges in the Waterloo system, uh, I was, I was uh, you remember this, uh, there was a group of young uh, uh, sort of international students, I think they were from Sri Lanka, who actually, uh, began, oh no, from Cambodia, I'm sorry, who put together uh, a form of uh, automatic disposal. So you didn't have to have people going out in the fields with a long probe. Uh, this was a way now, uh, I don't know if it's ever worked, but at least it was the right idea. That if you can reduce the risk of landmine clearance and make it quicker and easier and more efficient, then you're gonna have a bigger bang uh, for your buck, or less bang for your bucks, actually, I guess. To, Use the right metaphor. So I just think there's a lot of new thinking that has to be done, and that, and that and that's where maybe you know I hope we can stir that pot up a little bit to, to get uh, the, you know, the young men and women that the lady is talking about to say, uh, yeah, I mean, in your scale, you uh, put that to work. And I just think what a great tribute we we got the landmine treaty started. In 96, 97. Wouldn't it be nice if this generation said we don't need a treaty anymore because there's no more landmines or unidentified weapons? Boy, what an accomplishment for that generation to be. Thanks, Lloyd. I've got a, um, two questions that I think uh, probably I'll aim them at you, Lloyd, first. Uh, one in particular, but um, Olivia, um, keep an ear out and, and feel free to, to join in again as well. Um, the first one is from somebody you'll know quite well, Lloyd, from Ellen, right? Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Minister Axworthy, oh. can you give us some colour and more detail about the relationship between the NGOs and government in negotiating the treaty? Um, uh, I think it was, uh, to begin with, probably marriages of convenience. Uh, you know, when I was in politics for a long time, uh, there was always a kind of a, oh, let me say, uh, a division. Uh, government governed and uh, NGOs uh, advocated. I think what happened with the landmine, we began to, to work realizing that we needed each other, that one couldn't do without the other. And it was really a, a kind of a synergy. Uh, I think there was a lot of uh, suspicion that went on. I mean, I know that... Uh, one, one event that uh, still kind of rankles a little bit, the uh, end of the negotiating uh, period in Oslo when the treaty was finally being drafted, uh, the Prime Minister and I were in active discussion with uh, Bill Clinton and his National Security Advisor, with Madeleine Albright, about the Americans coming in. Uh, and uh, there were certain... Uh, NGOs, I guess, and also who misinterpreted that and thought that we were, we, I asked the, uh, the conference if it would extend its meetings for another 24 hours. 
I think that was interpreted and somehow uh, we were going to kind of uh, cave into American pressure, you know, to kind of uh, freeze the, the, the treaty. It was quite the opposite. But we thought that having the Americans inside the tent was much better than having them outside. So we worked very hard and we came very close. I came within, I'd like to tell the story that I, uh, I got a call in my office about uh, so nine o'clock at night to say that uh, uh, from a, an advisor in President Clinton's office saying, I think, uh, I think Clinton's going to go for it. And uh, I went home and told my wife it was time to break out that uh, bottle of 12-year-old McAllen. Uh, and as I, as I sat down to open the, the seal, the phone came in and said, no, he's changed his mind. The Pentagon got to him, da, da, da. And I said, I think it's a good time to have another uh, double shot of McAllen along the way. But we worked really hard to do that. And now that was kind of playing pragmatic politics. I mean, I, I could see where people uh, might interpret it that we were we were just sort of kowtowing, but it was quite the opposite. We, you know, our, our judgment uh, was that if we get the Americans on board, uh, I mean, it would have really taken off. Uh, but it didn't happen. And that was a, a case where I think we had to overcome the suspicions. But once that happened and the treaty was signed, there was a very close collaboration in making it work. Of, of, we put a lot of money as a government of Canada at the time into, uh, into the NGO world, for example, to set up the land, landline monitor uh, to get it up and running so that people on the ground, uh, so people in civil society would be the monitors. It wasn't going to be kind of people in observer missions. It was uh, We put a lot of money into uh, enabling other countries to come and uh, ratify the treaty. We had teams of people going, uh, and they were mixers, uh, people from the academy, people from civil society, people from our own uh, uh, officialdom, who would go to smaller countries and kind of coach them about how the treaty would work, how they could implement it. We would put money into their first efforts at team money. So I, I think it, that to me, it was a model of being able to work together uh, but it had some rocky patches to it. Uh, Olivia, I'm going to connect that question to the next one, and I'm going to lead with you on this. Um, this is from, from Kevin Spooner from the Military Studies Center. Um, and I'm, I'm aiming this at you because you do so much work with NGOs in the field. Um, the question, what are the risks and or benefits of working from outside the UN system to achieve major international agreements? Uh, what are the risks and benefits for the international community and for Canada of working outside the UN system? Um, so from the NGO perspective, uh, the biggest benefit is that we as humanitarians were impartial and we're neutral. So we wouldn't even start clearance operations or survey operations until both parties have stopped fighting and we have permission from both parties to be on that land. So I think um, those two key are key points to our, ac to our access. And going in as a military, you don't have that kind of uh, neutrality. Even going in with the UN, you might not have the same type of neutrality that humanitarian agencies are really were experts at uh, negotiations, especially access negotiations. So we know how to speak to both sides and both sides do trust us um, in our impartiality. Uh, now I owe money into my, my, I forgot to unmute jar. Oh, I almost got through it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got uh, a note saying we've got time for one more question, and I'll put this to both of you. Um, oh, there is a note from Paul Heidebrecht that the Waterloo students that, that Lloyd mentioned are still hard at it in Cambodia, and the oh, website. Really? Yeah, oh, they used to, they oh, used yeah. to be called the Landmine Boys, but now it's called D-Mine Robotics. So you can find them as D-Mine Robotics. That's um, terrific. That's great. Right. Right. But the the question for both of you, uh, again, from Linda from Brantford Laurier, how do we get involved and lend our voice to end landmines? Let me start with you, um, Olivia, and then we'll finish with Lloyd. So Olivia, over to you. Um, I would really suggest um, 
doing, doing your research as much as you can. You can reach out to us as board members of the Landmine Foundation to see where you can solicit more information, but spreading the awareness amongst your personal networks. It all, the ocean is made of one drop at a time. And that's how this kind of mm -hmm. advocacy approach works is you go home to your personal networks and talk to people who would otherwise not give this a second thought. And then it becomes something that's on their radar next time they go in to vote, next time they meet with their local MP, and we can give you talking points to support that. So we're happy to do that at any time. And if this is uh, my last word, I really have to give a big, huge shout out to Christy McLennan from Minds Advisory Group and to Ed LaJoy from Halo Trust uh, in their discussions over the last two months as I prepared for this webinar. But please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be here to help you with that. Excellent. And Lloyd? Well, well I, I actually... Uh... We can't improve upon what Lydia is. I think it is so much a, a question of a personal missionary work of, of spreading the word. Uh, I, I go back, uh, I'll see if I remember when the Landmine Foundation was established. Uh, there was a whole network of high schools uh, across the country which would hold uh, pizza sales and I think to raise money for Cambodia and other things. Uh, we had at one time a very, uh, really very supportive. Uh, network of rotary clubs uh, that were not only sort of providing money, but also inviting uh, talks about what happened with landmines and uh, and, uh, and IDEs and stuff like that. So, so I, I think it has to be kind of uh, re-energized. But I think you have to find a new narrative around it. And I think uh, so many of what we're now becoming conscious of is just how how destructive our generation has been in terms of the world we live in and that uh, i think landmines are one of those ways in which we've corrupted and contaminated the world and i think that that should be part of the messaging that we that we get out and i think that's why uh you know there is a, a real role to play with some uh use of the new tools of communication uh, of social media but also, I mean, I would, if I had to make a recommendation, I would say to anybody watching this is that get in touch with Olivia Fernandez and talk to her because I think she's out there on the edge. Me, I'm sort of uh, sitting on uh, not quite my rocking chair, but uh, uh, I've become, uh, to use the, uh, the indigenous word, an elder in this area, although I'm still working on refugee issues, which kind of keeps me off the street. Uh, so, so uh, but I, I think that there is really, uh, I know this sounds cliche, and I'm sorry, this is a new generation um, sort of aspiration. And I think uh, the more we can share our knowledge of what has gone on and what it did, I, I mean, I, I think we have to overcome this feeling, oh, it doesn't matter what I do. I don't know how many times I've had people say, oh, I can't make a difference. Uh, look, uh, <clears throat> the land might, process, the Ottawa process, is how a lot of ordinary people uh, in all around the globe came together, networked, and they got, as I think as one of the commentators in the documentary said, they got governments to be interested. Uh, I will remember, I'll just tell you one quick anecdote before it goes off. I was in my office one day and they, uh, I was told that I had a phone call from one of my uh, counterparts in Europe and as I picked up the phone he was screaming at me and I was holding the phone like this and he kept saying turn it off, turn it off I said turn it off, he said the fax machine those are days we used fax <laughs> because he was being inundated by a group of people in his country demanding that his government sign the treaty <laughs> and I said turn them off I'm, I'm going to sort of give them an endorsement uh, he and I didn't speak for a while after that but it worked. And it really was a, a kind of inside, outside, uh, work the street, uh, work the corridors uh, kind of combination that brought it together. I just think now that uh, that's, that same notion now has to be retranslated, be translated into a contemporary uh, vernacular and a, and a particularly contemporary narrative 
Uh, and I think that that's why the Ottawa process is that you can make a difference. Thanks. And on behalf of the Canadian Landmine Foundation, um, I want to thank both of you. You're on the board, but I want to thank both of you yeah, well, sure. for, <laughs> for speaking mm -hmm. tonight. And, and I will say as well, uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with us, um, you can go to our website um, or you're welcome to email me um, directly um, uh, and I can put you in touch with, with Olivia as well. Um, and uh, on the Landmine Foundation website, you'll find a lot of information about the Landmine Challenge. Um, one of the best things you can do if you're going to be in touch with an MP is be informed and know the facts um, so that you can bring, bring the facts to them. Now, Alistair, one question. Will the, will the documentary uh, be available on, uh, on the website or, or can people uh, begin to share it? I was just thinking it would be a, a great 10-minute uh, introduction in a classroom or, or at a Rotary Club or uh, mm -hmm. with, your, your, with your friend's book club. Uh, Yes, sadly we can't. That, that's why um, Richard Fatusi designed this one very specially for us because they don't have permissions for some of the images yet. Um, oh, okay. so, so before anything can be shared publicly, before it could even go on YouTube, um, all of that legal stuff will have to be done. Right. So this, this was a very special event just for us. Great. Okay. okay. Well, it was well worthwhile. We have to thank Richard for that. Oh, I definitely will. Uh, Eric, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Alistair. And I'd like to, to reiterate just a, a thanks from the, the Laurier Military Center to both uh, Olivia and also to Lloyd for generously donating your time tonight. It was a super interesting, fascinating talk, thinking about history, thinking about the past and how we might re-engage in the future as well. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank Alistair for being such a, a gracious host for us this evening. Um, so with that, we will wrap things up. Our next event will actually take place in about two weeks um, on the 1st of December at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time with your moderator, actually, Alistair Edgar. Um, and he's going to be speaking on the future of peace building after the disastrous evacuation of Afghanistan earlier this Great. year. Oh, interesting. So it will be... A, it will be I'll, a I'll sign up, Alistair. Yes, it will be a it'll be a great event uh, to wrap things up for 2021 for us. Lloyd, you're not allowed to ask me any hard questions then. OK, OK. <laughs> Um, and if you're interested in registering for this event, um, I will share it in the chat with you once we're done. Um, but you can go to canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash speakers. Um, and a lot of you will actually, when you end the webinar, you'll actually be, um, the URL that you'll be directed to is the Canadian Landmine Foundation website. So if you are wanting to, you know, find some more information, figure out how you can get involved or donate, um, you can do so right, right on there, right after this webinar tonight. Um, and for us at the Laurier Military Center, if you want to keep up with other events such as this one, other webinars, speaking events, conferences, and publications, um, you can go to our website again at canadianmilitaryhistory.ca, but forward slash subscribe at the end. Um, enter in your information and you'll get regular updates from us, regular emails on events such as this one. Um, one more time, thanks so much to the moderator, to the guests, the panelists this evening. It was a great discussion and I hope we can have you again at some point in the future for another one of these discussions, hopefully one that speaks to the re-engagement of Canadians and politicians mm -hmm. on the world stage um, to be able to, to do things such as uh, putting together the Ottawa Treaty and the advocacy work that um, Olivia and others have done um, surrounding landmines. So thanks to everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your night, a great rest of the week, and we will see you back here again at the beginning of December with, uh, with our very own Alistair. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care, Good everybody. Bye-bye.